I started to, um, as it were, negotiate uh, my talk with the um, uh, with the institute. Um, the um, emphasis was very much on um, sort of how has the Arab Spring really shaped the uh, uh, the neighborhood policy, and we we, we started. Um, if you want negotiating my talk, um, well, even before uh, the um, EU, uh, the Commission came out with its uh, big new uh, strategy paper in May uh, last year. So, uh, in many ways, I mean, it's um, it's quite amazing to to see how an area of uh, policy that, um, in many ways, I personally thought was not exactly a boom area where you could really make a mark and um, get famous, uh, how that really has bounced back uh, over the last uh, year um, or so, I would say. Um, so from this perspective, the, the idea of um, uh, having a talk about rethinking the ENP in many ways is um, more relevant today, I think, than it was uh, a year ago. But I also think it's... Um, very much to the credit of um, this institute that um, we basically started about or started thinking about this uh, a year ago when it wasn't really quite clear whether that would be a talk uh, that would um, uh, at all be be relevant. So the take that, um, that I'm going to um, uh, have on rethinking the ENP um, is really in many ways um, sort of partly a historical account of where the uh, ENP uh, has come from uh, all the way to where it is uh, now and where one might think or hope or wish uh, that it uh, should be going. So it's not going to be a very academic paper in the sense that I'll bore you with all kinds of theories of neo-institutionalism and functionalism and how it came about. Um, but rather one that um, sort of starts from the um, observation that um, in many ways, I mean, the, the ENP started out very much as an alternative to enlargement uh, as a policy back in uh, 2002, uh, 2003, when the idea uh, was born. But in my view, has developed um, uh, to this uh, day in not exactly a fundamentally different uh, direction, but certainly into a direction where I would describe the ENP now much more as a uh, sort of regional foreign and security uh, policy with a, with a particular emphasis on uh, security. Now, this is where it's a little bit academic and being sort of um, at least partially uh, uh, full-time or well, part-time, really, um, a professor as well, I have to give sort of some um, more um, conceptual grounding uh, to what I'm going to talk about. So I want to say one or two things about this very idea of security and uh, security uh, policy uh, in the beginning, because this is really where I think um, a lot of how we understand where the ENP is today and where it's likely to go, um, I think, has to be tied in with this idea of uh, uh, security and also what it means in a in EU and in an uh, ENP uh, context. So <clears throat> I think um, it's very obvious that um, uh, security is a key interest uh, and purpose for the European Union. And we are talking really here about uh, security in the sense for um, the EU, as a collective of its member states and uh, citizens. Uh, so there's no doubt in my mind that this is one of the key purposes uh, of the uh, European Union. But what does security actually mean from um, an EU or ENP uh, perspective? I think here I sort of um, generally also in, in my teaching uh, use um, uh, a definition that defines uh, security as a low probability of damage to acquired values. Uh, so the things that you value um, are relatively unlikely to get harmed or um, uh, damaged. And if that's the case, then you can say that you live in a secure environment or that you have a certain degree of uh, security. And that's all very well, but um, uh, the challenge, of course, is to keep that um, analytically meaningful. 
uh, so that not everything is uh, security, that not every sphere of life, every policy area then suddenly becomes somehow related to uh, security and security policy. I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense either um, academically, analytically, or from a policy uh, perspective. So the question then, of course, is, well, what values uh, does the EU uh, have? And um, yes, I mean, there's no question, the EU community of values, and it's in all the uh, treaties, and uh, Article 2 of the consolidated version of the Treaty on European Union states that the EU's values are respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and human and minority um, rights. Now, I think that's um, fairly uh, basic in the sense that I don't think um, many people would uh, uh, dispute that these are both important values, but also values uh, which the EU generally uh, seeks to uh, uphold. Now, where it becomes interesting in the context of the ENP, uh, of course, is that the ENP does have this uh, vision, as it is uh, frequently uh, referred to, um, of a ring of countries around the EU that share these fundamental values uh, of the EU. And um, even today, uh, with um, all the hopes that one might pin onto the uh, Arab Spring, if you remember the values, uh, human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law, and so on and so forth, it is not easy to see how this vision of a ring of friends around the EU who share all of these values um, um, and hold them as in as high a regard as the EU can really be uh, accomplished. So the ENP in the same uh, breath, basically, that it says this is what we want, also acknowledges that um, there is, of course, a, um, as they put it in one of the uh, early documents, um, there is variation in the degree of commitment uh, uh, to these common values uh, in the uh, partner countries uh, for the ENP. So um, from, from that perspective, there's already a tension, I think, uh, within uh, uh, the ENP from the perspective of the values that the EU seeks to promote and the values that it assumes are essential uh, to sort of create uh, this uh, situation of security uh, for the EU and the relative likelihood of these values being shared in the uh, immediate uh, neighborhood. Um, so um, what, uh, however, also is, uh, is very clear uh, in um, all the EU uh, policy documents, not just on ENP, but uh, more generally also, is that um, the EU increasingly um, has seen, uh, certainly over the past uh, uh, 10 years, its own security very much linked to stability in the neighborhood. And stability in the neighborhood then by extension is often seen as um, sort of a function of how well uh, these values that the EU has are actually being implemented there. So there's, a, um, I think, an underlying assumption here that if only these countries around the EU would share and respect the same values as we do, then everything would be stable, and if everything is stable, then the EU would be uh, secure. And I'll come back to um, well, the, some problems that um, uh, exist, obviously, in this uh, respect later on. <clears throat> so from a rethinking perspective of the EMP, uh, then, rethinking it as from where it started, alternative to enlargement, to the direction where I think it's heading, a regional foreign and security policy, I think there are three different considerations that one uh, uh, can make. Um, the first one is, um, if you want to rethink ENP, we could rethink the policy process. So how is the policy actually being made? Uh, that would be very much sort of a look at the EU institutions and who shapes which uh, policy and who votes on what and who gets out all the uh, strategy documents and who puts the money uh, uh, behind them and so on and so uh, forth. And that is certainly a valid uh, uh, perspective, but I'm not an EU institutionalist uh, uh, from this perspective, so I sometimes struggle even to understand what all the different parts of the EU um, uh, are doing and how they are involved with a particular policy. What I'm more interested in is actually picking up at the time when the 
policy process in terms of producing an outcome, sort of generating a policy, uh, is done. And then my interest is in how these outcomes, the policies that the Commission or the Council uh, uh, produce, how they actually translate into specific impacts. So how then does actually something change on uh, the ground, which in course of, in, in, uh, of course in the case of the ENP means to what extent do the policies that the EU has actually generate the impacts in the sense of getting people to value the same things that we do and sort of structure their states and societies uh, in a way that there is respect for um, dignity, freedom, democracy, uh, and so on and uh, so forth. Um, so I think um, in, in that perspective, my rethinking, uh, uh, if you want, of uh, ENP is very much focused on this nexus between outcomes and impact. Um, so what policies does the EU uh, generate and how likely or what track record do they have in generating the desirable impacts that the EU expects uh, from its uh, policy. So in order to do that, um, I sort of want to start out um, uh, looking very briefly at um, ENP as it was uh, created sort of in the, in the early phase, roughly between 2002 and 2006, as um, really an alternative to uh, enlargement. Uh, so 2002, the Copenhagen Council finalizes what uh, comes to be uh, known as the Big Bang uh, Enlargement, and at the same time also says, well, um, we kind of need to think what we do with the, with the other uh, countries that are not part of the uh, enlargement, that also don't have an enlargement uh, uh, perspective. Um, so how will the EU relate to them uh, uh, in the future? And it does so very much uh, with this uh, uh, perspective that you then find in the uh, 2003 um, uh, wider Europe communication uh, from the Commission that basically says, well, the EU can only be secure if its neighborhood is uh, stable. Um, so very much a driving force uh, behind the um, uh, sort of early thoughts on um, uh, neighborhood policy was that we need to create a credible alternative to uh, enlargement that will keep these other countries, if you want, reasonably happy uh, so that they don't become hostile uh, uh, to the EU. But at the same time, we still have uh, this vision that um, these are also countries uh, that um, sort of share some of our values and actually implement them in uh, their own states and uh, societies. Um, so uh, what happens then as a um, uh, sort of a result uh, of uh, the um, Copenhagen Council uh, meeting in uh, uh, 2002 is that Sort of over the next uh, year uh, or two, there are some uh, quite significant changes to the to the original design of uh, ENP. Uh, so the first one is that um, 2003 at the uh, uh, Thessaloniki um, uh, Council, the Western Balkans are firmly taken out of uh, the emerging neighborhood policy by giving them a very clear enlargement uh, perspective. Um, also, very early on in the uh, documents on neighborhood policy, so there is this idea that Russia should be covered by this uh, uh, policy uh, as well. But you have um, uh, an EU-Russia uh, uh, summit in uh, St. Petersburg uh, late in 2003, where Russia basically says, well, very kind of you, but thank you. We don't want to be the same as everybody else. We want to have our own special relationship, privileged uh, uh, partnership. So Russia is also out uh, of the um, ENP uh, from late 2003 uh, onwards. But then you could almost say somehow the EU had this vision that there need to be a certain number of countries in the ENP. So they then decide uh, in uh, 2004 that actually the countries of the South Caucasus, um, which even by the most... Um, sort of forward-looking designs uh, would still be about five to 600 miles uh, away from any real borders uh, uh, of the EU. They then are actually uh, incorporated in the uh, ENP so that by the time that um, the um, ENP uh, strategy uh, paper in 2004 uh, is published, 
you basically have a, a set of countries uh, that cover uh, all the southern and eastern uh, Mediterranean countries, uh, part of the uh, original uh, Barcelona uh, process that dates back to 1995. Um, you have the so-called Western uh, NIS countries, uh, Belarus, um, Moldova, and uh, Ukraine. And you have the three uh, countries in the South Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and uh, uh, Georgia. Now, um, all of this, um, uh, of course, uh, already gives you um, a good flavor uh, of um, all the various security challenges that these countries, of course, bring. Uh, with them and with which the ENP uh, somehow will have to, uh, to deal. But the, um, uh, if you want the, the links with the security that are there uh, in the early stages of the, uh, of the ENP, which don't make it a security policy yet uh, uh, per se, but which I think are then uh, eventually themes that are developed uh, uh, more, more thoroughly and, and more credibly, I think, over the um, uh, following uh, half decade. Uh, first of all, that um, I think there's a very um, clear but um, relatively implicit um, uh, vision here that um, giving these countries a credible alternative to enlargement is vital uh, for their uh, stability and hence for uh, EU uh, security. But also you find a number of specific uh, uh, references in the 2004 uh, EMP strategy paper uh, that make uh, reference to the um, 2003 uh, European security uh, strategy that raise foreign and security policy issues as part of a political uh, uh, dialogue and even go as far as saying that some of the uh, ENP partner countries could very well um, be included in um, certain CFSP and ESDP uh, missions that the EU might um, um, la launch or perform uh, from uh, time to time. But um, what is uh, very clear, and um, um, this is sort of my, my final point on this, is that um, the early ENP um, is much more clearly not enlargement, um, so the alternative uh, to enlargement, uh, then it is um, sort of uh, foreign and security policy, or certainly it is very clearly not yet um, a real foreign and security uh, uh, policy. Then between 2006 and 2010, I would say there is sort of a, um, a transition phase um, in which um, to some extent I think the ENP uh, still is, but it's very much sort of at the end of it and coming out of a, um, a transition phase, which, which I think uh, make it uh, much more clearly a, a foreign and security policy. Um, now, um, this uh, phase basically ends, um, strictly speaking, only in, uh, uh, in 2011, and clearly this year is probably the most significant year for the ENP um, since 2003, uh, 2004. It's significant in two ways. On the one hand, um, never ever, not even in 2003 or 2004, has the EU produced so many strategy documents uh, on the ENP. So there are, this year alone, um, in the first um, uh, five months, uh, you have four commission uh, strategy uh, papers on uh, uh, the ENP. Um, but also, and that's perhaps more important, um, and shows the commitment uh, that the EU has found, uh, again, I would say, uh, to the ENP, is that um, uh, was only last week that um, uh, the um, draft uh, proposals uh, from the Commission uh, came out for the ENP budget for the period 2014 to 2020. And they actually, uh, and you really have to also see that in the context of the current financial crisis, they proposed a 40% increase in funding for the ENP compared to the previous uh, uh, period, raising the total budget that in all likelihood will be available uh, to a little bit over 18 billion uh, euros. Uh, so now that could pay off quite a lot of debt uh, uh, if you want in, um, uh, in a number of countries. Um, so, uh, and I think in, in one way, um, the ground for these uh, uh, changes, including those that are um, incorporated in the, in the new strategy documents, 
was partly prepared between 2006 uh, and 2010. But the ground that was prepared, uh, I think, really seemed to take the ENP in a very different direction by the end of 2010, which was basically a direction of focusing on the so-called Eastern uh, uh, partnership, rather than what I think is now um, uh, probably the more obvious direction in which it's going, namely uh, towards the south and the, uh, the southern neighborhood. Um, so just very briefly on sort of what happened between 2006 and um, uh, early this year, there were two reviews um, out on the ENP in 2006 and uh, uh, 2007, which don't really do much in terms of enhancing uh, security as a theme in the EMP, but they certainly affirm um, that this is one of the uh, uh, purposes of the EMP, namely to increase EU security by means of um, um, more stability uh, within the uh, neighborhood countries. More significantly, and I think this is the, um, uh, the real um, sort of substantive uh, change that we see in the ENP between uh, 2006 and uh, 2010 is, develop is the development of the uh, Eastern Partnership, um, 2008, uh, uh, 2009. So it's, it started as a conceptual, as a strategic development uh, in 2008, um, council meeting in, uh, in June, and then obviously accelerated as a result of the war between Russia and Georgia in uh, August. And then you have the fabulous uh, launch of the uh, Eastern Partnership at the Prague Summit in uh, uh, 2009, in uh, May. But uh, the launch of the uh, Eastern Partnership, um, I think, also highlights another um, important uh, dimension in the way in which the ENP has developed. And that, I think, is the um, much keener appreciation of the need for a regional differentiation. Uh, uh, that comes with the ENP. So initially it was sort of this sort of one policy uh, catch uh, 16 uh, uh, different uh, countries and it's all really figured out in bilateral relations with relatively or comparatively little money being spent on regional and intra-regional uh, cooperation. That very much changes uh, with the um, onset of the uh, Eastern Partnership and even more so, I think what you actually find with the Eastern Partnership is also intra-regional uh, differentiation, which comes, I think, sort of um, in, the, in the first half of 2010 when it becomes very obvious that, um, yes, Eastern Partnership is great, but Moldova and Ukraine are in a very different place than uh, Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan, not to mention uh, uh, countries like, like Georgia and, uh, and Belarus. So intra-regional differentiation begins to, uh, I think, uh, take um, or gain traction uh, in particular within uh, the development of the Eastern uh, uh, Partnership. Um, also, the, um, there's quite a lot of uh, effort um, and, and thought goes into um, implementation reports uh, that come out in 2009 and uh, uh, 2010. And these basically uh, highlight also the, uh, the progress that the uh, Eastern Partnership has made, particular in relation to Ukraine and uh, uh, Moldova. And Moldova, from a security perspective, is also interesting in the sense that the EU uh, finally, sort of from 2009 uh, onwards, but then increasingly, um, I think over 2010, 2011, also becomes much more engaged in uh, the uh, conflict in uh, Transnistria, one of the so-called frozen conflicts in the uh, former Soviet Union. So by the end of 2010, basically all the signs uh, are there that if the ENP is to have uh, a future, if it is ever going to be a sustainable success at all, then it will be in the Eastern uh, partnership. Uh, but then, of course, um, sort of there is um, a real world uh, outside of Brussels, uh, uh, of course, and I don't mean that in a, a sort of pejorative uh, way, and that real world somehow um, seems to have decided that actually things are going to happen now in the uh, so-called southern dimension of the um, uh, European uh, neighborhood. And suddenly we have the uh, Arab Spring, and, um, well, I don't think anybody can claim that they uh, predicted that or that they could have known that and that they have always told us that that's uh, where things um, uh, were going to go. 
And the Arab Spring really, I think, is a major impetus uh, um, for a reinvigoration of uh, the uh, European uh, neighborhood policy. And it very much, I think, directs um, the, the main effort and focus of the ENP probably for years to come uh, towards um, uh, the southern neighborhood, despite the fact that there is another uh, Eastern Partnership Summit um, in Warsaw at the end of uh, uh, September. But um, I think you really have to be a very keen uh, EU watcher uh, and Eastern Partnership watcher to actually have noticed that among all the other things that were going on, especially because the end of September was, of course, also quite significant in terms of um, events in, uh, uh, in Libya that captured far more um, attention um, than um, the, the summit in, in, in Warsaw. So um, in May uh, 2011, uh, we get um, a new communication uh, uh, from the Commission uh, boldly entitled A New Response to a Changing uh, Neighborhood, which is basically um, sort of a review um, and uh, a new strategy, if you want, for uh, the European uh, neighborhood policy. And the, there's an interesting genesis uh, uh, to that uh, document. It was basically commissioned, if you want, uh, uh, back uh, in 2010, um, basically to see, well, where is the ENP now that uh, the Lisbon Treaty is in place with all the institutional changes, and where does it fit, and, and, and what does it uh, do? Not least also in the sense that um, sort of as an interesting institutional piece of trivia, ENP uh, started out as part of the uh, portfolio of the then Commissioner for External Relations and Neighborhood Policy. Um, in the first Barroso administration, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ferrero Waldner. Um, but then, with the creation of the uh, new post of the um, High Representative of the Union and foreign, on Foreign and Security Affairs, um, post now held by uh, Baroness Ashton, um, there is no DG Relax uh, uh, in this sense anymore. So, neighborhood policy is then attached uh, to enlargement. Uh, so, you could almost say it's come full circle from being an alternative to enlargement to sitting more or less comfortably in the same um, uh, uh, portfolio as um, uh, enlargement policy um, now held by um, the Czech uh, Commissioner uh, Stefan Fühler. Um, so, but leaving that aside, um, basically you have the um, 2010 um, regular, re regular review of the ENP uh, that was meant to produce a new strategy uh, anyway. And then on top of that, you get uh, the Arab Spring. So uh, there is real need, uh, uh, real requirement uh, for the ENP actually to take care of two um, uh, important changes. One, the institutional changes that happen uh, post-Lisbon uh, uh, implementation. And second, uh, this really uh, a tremendous and momentous change that happens uh, across the um, southern and eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean in, in the course of the uh, Arab Spring. Of course, it takes the Commission uh, a little while to, uh, uh, to do that, so we actually only have the, um, this new response uh, communication by the end of May uh, 2011. But before then, there are actually already indications that um, sort of things really are moving uh, very significantly uh, uh, towards the south because there are two uh, prior papers. One, at least in terms of publication, only predates the um, new response um, uh, communication by a day, uh, but the other one comes out in March. Um, and the two new um, ENP-related uh, strategy uh, documents uh, are entirely focused on the southern Mediterranean. Uh, one is the so-called Dialogue for Migration, Mobility and Security, and the other one is the Partnership for Democracy and uh, Shared uh, Prosperity. Um, now, in all of these, um, you have um, a much more um, significant emphasis on political cooperation, which is sort of a well, you could almost say a euphemism for uh, a cooperation between the EU and partner countries on uh, matters of um, security and uh, uh, conflict, uh, conflict resolution. 
And even though uh, the new response uh, um, communication tries to cover Eastern partnership as well as the Southern uh, dimension, uh, a lot of what is being said in particular in, in respect to, to security and, and conflict really is uh, very much geared uh, towards uh, the uh, Southern dimension. And I mean, this in many ways is not uh, particularly uh, uh, surprising in the sense that um, there is, um, of course, an enormous amount of uh, security-related uh, uh, problems in the uh, southern neighborhood. And these are partially problems that predate uh, the Arab Spring. So it's not to say that the Arab Spring caused all kinds of uh, problems that were never there before and that it was a beautifully stable uh, if not particularly democratic region uh, uh, before. But the other important um, uh, aspect uh, to bear in mind is that, of course, the, um, there are two types of security challenges in the southern neighborhood. Uh, one is um, problems really within the southern neighborhood that primarily affect uh, uh, the countries uh, there themselves, their stability, their uh, future prospects. And then there's a second uh, category of security challenges, um, which in many ways are symptoms um, of the former, but they are much of much greater interest from an EU security uh, uh, perspective. Um, so just to illustrate that uh, uh, briefly, I mean, the problems in this other neighborhood uh, uh, itself, um, many of which, um, as I said, uh, predate the Arab Spring, include quite a number of latent or unresolved conflicts uh, uh, between states that primarily evolve around borders in the uh, Middle East, uh, say between Israel and Syria, um, Israel and uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, a lot of uh, communal, uh, sectarian, secessionist uh, conflicts and civil wars, um, including the you know, on-off power struggles that you have in Lebanon, in the Palestinian uh, territories, um, self-determination struggle in, in Western Sahara, um, Morocco uh, here uh, involved. Um, obviously, there is the um, Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, um, which is part of a, um, which happens in the, in the much broader regional setting of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and in which the EU, uh, of course, um, plays some kind of role uh, through its membership in the Middle East uh, Quartet. And then on top of all of that, um, as if that wasn't enough yet, you also get a lot of problems that are triggered by the Arab uh, Spring. So I'm not just thinking here that um, we have the violent toppling of uh, uh, Gaddafi in Libya, the continuing problems in Egypt, uh, uh, the problems in, in Syria, but also I think there is a large measure of unpredictability uh, uh, still here. So I'm still not entirely convinced that at whenever we come to the end of the Arab Spring, we really will have democratic uh, countries uh, there, or countries that make things better for a large number of uh, uh, their citizens. So uh, it's the element of uncertainty, I think, that is, um, uh, that is quite um, disconcerting here. Now, all of that, um, you could say, well, that's a regional problem. I mean, you have these things uh, going on elsewhere and they are not immediately uh, seen as a security uh, threat for the EU. The problem, however, is that in many ways these, this local instability, um, um, the change, the uncertainty, the violence, uh, and all of uh, the other aspects connected with that, they, of course, um, sort of constitute security challenges uh, to the EU because they give rise to, to other dynamics that are seen as very clear uh, and immediate security threats uh, to the EU. Um, so things like uh, illegal uh, migration, uh, transnational organized uh, uh, crime, um, international terrorism, supply and uh, transit uh, dimensions for uh, European energy uh, security. And regardless of how strong, uh, how much, um, how causal you see uh, the link between instability and um, these more immediate uh, security concerns that the EU has, they are certainly there in all the documents that the EU um, uh, sort of drafts on these issues, uh, produces, puts out, at, uh, puts out at, uh, as uh, strategies. So in this sense, there is certainly an appreciation um, 
that uh, again is I think confirmed by some of the events that we have seen um, since the onset of the Arab Spring over the past uh, year or so, that stability in the neighborhood, in this case the southern neighborhood, but also uh, of course by extension uh, countries covered by the Eastern uh, Partnership, that stability there is really crucial for EU uh, security. Now you could argue, well, that's um, not exactly uh, new or surprising, and the EU should have been thinking about this before. And you could argue, yes, they have been thinking about this before, and um, therefore uh, that might actually explain that there isn't really that much new in terms of policies in the so-called new response to uh, a changing neighborhood. Yeah, if you were really sort of um, harsh, you would say, well, there's sort of some cosmetic changes, some things are more emphasized, other things are less emphasized. Um, so in many ways, um, I think there is a lot of um, uh, old wine in new bottles. Uh, so the EU in many ways reaffirms um, its commitment to a set of policies that do not exactly have a stellar track record in actually delivering the kind of impact that the EU wants. So after 10 years of ENP, uh, you could basically ask, well, where is this ring of uh, countries uh, around the EU that actually share our values? And if it's not there, then, well, maybe the policies that we have produced as part of the ENP are not exactly worth recycling and putting another 18 billion uh, euros into them for the next uh, uh, seven uh, years. However, I think there is one genuinely uh, new uh, element um, that comes out of the a new response communication. And this is a commitment to um, an enhanced EU support uh, for implementation of uh, settlements. Uh, so basically what in other language you would call post-conflict reconstruction or post-conflict state building or something uh, like that. Um, and I think this is actually at least potentially um, very uh, promising um, in two perspectives. The first one is that obviously uh, the EU is really not very good at the hard side of CSDP. Uh, so it simply doesn't do particularly well for a whole number of reasons on military uh, uh, security issues, military missions, and so on and so forth. Um, so well, they need something else to do if they really want to create, uh, I think, uh, uh, stability. Um, and I think the case of Libya and the uh, rather embarrassing um, well, saga of the EU's uh, military uh, operation uh, there, which never uh, happened, um, I think is, is testament to that. But the other and perhaps more optimistic uh, way of um, sort of putting some faith into um, EU's stabilization, state-building efforts is actually that the EU does have significant experience and success in what in EU language would be civilian crisis management uh, operations. Uh, so yes, you might say the Balkans are not exactly a success story, but on and off, I mean, the EU has managed to keep the region reasonably uh, uh, stable uh, for the past uh, uh, 15, uh, 16 uh, years. It has had um, um, quite a lot of other successes in much uh, in places much farther uh, away. Um, I mean, Arce in uh, East Timor is a, a, a good example here. So uh, from this perspective, um, I think um, there is certainly some hope that uh, if the EU were to focus um, on what you might call sort of soft security issues, post-conflict uh, state building, which will be very, very relevant, in particular in the southern neighborhood, if you look at cases like Libya, what might come uh, of uh, Syria, significant questions still to be answered uh, by, um, uh, by Egypt, who knows where Algeria will be heading and so on and so forth. So there is actually a real um, uh, impetus, I think, to um, refocus uh, on the ENP and to give the ENP as a, as a policy that the EU has um, at least some benefit uh, uh, of, um, uh, of doubt. This is not to say that there aren't um, quite significant problems that obviously uh, remain. And um, I want to sort of uh, conclude by outlining some of the problems, but also, well, as always, um, or as I always try to do, end on an optimistic note. And uh, 
sort of highlight the great opportunities uh, uh, that come. So what are the problems? As I see them, and again, I'm not an EU institution uh, watcher. I look more at outcomes and impact. Um, there are four problems. Uh, the first one is that um, for all intents and purposes, the EU still has not found an effective common voice on foreign and security policy across member states and institutions. Uh, so there is still a lot of, um, well, it's either smallest common denominator, which is often enough embarrassing, um, or it's a lot of uh, infighting, um, both between member states uh, and institutions, but also uh, among them. I think there is um, another problem related in particular uh, in the context of uh, ENP to this, and this is that very often um, the internal security agenda of the EU dominates. Um, and that in many ways means that the EU is much more willing and to some extent much more effective of treating symptoms, so illegal migration, um, organized crime and so on and so forth, rather than developing uh, a comprehensive strategy that would actually aim at the causes of these problems. Um, so again, I mean, it's from an, if we see for a second the EU as a sort of regular state actor, I mean, that's normal. I mean, states focus on their own interests, uh, and if they can achieve their interests by just sort of dealing with uh, symptoms um, of particular problems, then that's uh, what they do not least in, uh, in a time of uh, financial austerity. The third problem is that uh, the EU's capacity for developing and implementing an effective uh, uh, security uh, policy, foreign and security policy, if you want, remains underdeveloped, certainly in terms uh, of um, human capacity, both in Brussels and in the delegations. And if you look at the uh, European External Action Service, it's basically full of bureaucrats, uh, people who switched over from the Commission uh, to the EAS, not diplomats. Uh, so people who can design a program and who can run projects and who can fill in forms and tick boxes and make sure that everything goes according uh, to process, but who don't always have um, sort of the political um, sense or sensitivities for a particular situation. And there are very, very few people in the uh, EAS in uh, Brussels, let alone in the delegation, who even have sort of a particular well, training in, say, conflict or security issues. Uh, so uh, I think that's a, um, that's a real human capacity uh, problem. And the final problem is, and I say that as somebody who is generally very pro-EU, there's a real disconnect between rhetoric and uh, uh, reality. Um, so the EU always postulates uh, this link based on its own history that as long as everybody uh, has reasonable levels of uh, democracy and uh, economic development, everything is just going to be fine. So the all persuasive power of um, offering countries help with their democratization and help with their economic development in order to create uh, prosperity, that that somehow automatically takes care of all kinds of security uh, challenges or all kinds of causes of instability. I think this is something that the EU or the people in the EU really have convinced themselves of but it doesn't work like that in reality, not least in the sense that it just takes much more time for, if this link really is there, for this link to materialize, and you very often don't have this amount of time. And if you look at how rapidly uh, some of the situations in the Arab Spring actually escalated uh, into very serious violence, and I mean, arguably we had a civil war in Libya and we may have yet another one, and we probably have a civil war in, uh, in Syria uh, uh, ongoing at this very moment as well, you can't just wait for countries to sort of redesign their institutions, make them more democratic, get enough uh, economic growth going so that everybody has a reasonable standard of living. By that time, I mean, people have died in there probably hundreds of, uh, of thousands. So in this sense, um, I think 
believing in this link between democracy, prosperity, and security, stability, it doesn't make up for the lack of a much more comprehensive um, and at times hard-hitting uh, security policy. And by the same token, the, the mechanism that the EU now emphasizes even more strongly, mechanism of conditionality, to say, well, unless you democratize, we won't give you money to do this, that, and the other, may just not be the mechanism to deliver the kind of stability that the EU wants in order to be more secure, let alone create its lovely ring of uh, friends. Um, now, having said all of these bad things about the EU and its approach, um, let me finish with um, three uh, opportunities that I see here and why I think that the EU is right to reinvest itself in the neighborhood policy and not just um, uh, in the south, but also uh, in the east. I think the first one is that the Arab Spring, for all the problems, for all the misgivings that one might have with it at the moment, it still does offer an unprecedented opportunity uh, for uh, the region of the southern and eastern Mediterranean to actually embark on the kind of change that might eventually see countries there, not necessarily an entire region, but countries there that share some of the core values that the EU uh, actually has. Um, and it's also important, um, with all the uh, differences that do exist, to bear in mind that this is, in many ways, not that dissimilar from the events that happened uh, post-1989 in Central and Eastern Europe. Yet, yeah, it's, it's different scale, it's different culture, um, all kinds of other uh, uh, differences here. But nonetheless, um, I think if 1989 tells us something, then it is actually that, yes, change can happen. Uh, who would have thought? And I'm East German myself, so I would not have thought, even in May 1989, that a year later we would have a social, economic, and currency union with West Germany, and a couple of months after that, be part of a reunited Germany. So change is possible. From that perspective, there is um, definitely an opportunity here. Second point, uh, second opportunity is that the ENP in the past has proven um, quite flexible uh, and adaptable. It is well funded, um, um, 18 point some odd billion for the next uh, uh, seven years. That's actually quite a big chunk uh, of money. But it also, I think, benefits from uh, the post-Lisbon institutional uh, changes within the EU that I think will certainly are conducive to a more effective um, uh, security uh, policy, foreign and security policy. And the final point um, I want to end with is that we have to remember that dictatorships are defeated in the streets and on the battlefield. But defeat of dictatorship, or of one dictatorship, does not immediately mean that you automatically get a democratic system in place. And to build the kind of stable, democratic, prosperous um, states that the EU envisages in its uh, neighborhood policy, um, these are actually um, tasks that require a very, very different uh, skill set from the one that NATO, for example, offers. And I personally believe if there is a kind of um, policy or set of policy tools out there that can potentially deliver building or can deliver on building stable, democratic, prosperous states after um, dictatorships, then it probably is the ENP. And from that perspective, I think we really should give the ENP uh, the benefit uh, of the doubt and keep our fingers crossed that uh, in the end we will, in some point in the future, have a ring of um, countries around the EU that share uh, our values and objectives. And on that really happy note, um, right in time for, uh, um, for the holidays, um, thank you very much uh, for your patience with me.